we are so happy to be able to bring you, our Bayside and Northeast Queens audience, interviews with the candidates that are running for a public office, and in this case, for civil court judge. We're here again with Jessica Earl Gargan. She is running for, for civil court judge in the county of Queens. And, uh, and we've seen her before. She's told us some great information. It was Thank very you. valuable. So, uh, but thanks again for talking to us and talking Thank to you. our audience, because everybody wants to know. This is a critical time in our, in our country, in our whole country's development, and the change that's taking place. And now we've got an election coming up. And if you want to see change, you got to go to the polls and you got to vote. So please tell our audience a, a little bit more about your background sure. again. And then, and then how you're seeing the court systems, where you've been in the court system, and how, uh, how you're going to make your mark in it. All right, um, again, my name is Jessica Earl Gargan, and I'm running for civil court judge of Queens County countywide, which means I'm running throughout the entire county of Queens, all the districts. Um, I'll be on the ballot in every voting location throughout Queens County. Um, if you've already gotten your ballots uh, from the mail-in voting that the governor has allowed, I'm, I'm up there on the top left-hand side and that'll be all throughout Queens County. Um, there are other people running for judgeships. There were four designees by the Queens County Democratic Party for the four openings for civil court that are coming up in January. Two of us are running in a primary, which means that we're, we have an opponent in the primary race seeking the Democratic nomination for the general election in November. The other candidate who was nominated by the Queens County Democratic Party who is facing an opponent is um, his name is Lee Chang and he's from this congressional district, the sixth congressional district, and he will only be on the ballot in the sixth congressional district as opposed to where I'm on it throughout the the county. So he's not really opponent. He's working with you and running with you. He's not running with me because we're not uh, running mates, but he's not running against me. So. Uh, I guess an easy way to put it is a vote for Lee isn't a vote against me, and a vote for me isn't a vote against Lee. Actually, that rhymes. I didn't, I didn't plan for it to. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, so I'm running for countywide. I've been in the court system for nearly 10 years, working with um, two distinguished judges. I began in civil court, the court that I'm seeking election to, working with Judge Maureen Healy. Um, and we worked there for several years together. And in civil court, I believe I said this in an earlier interview, but I can't say it enough. Um, civil court truly is the people's court. You have, you know, you have attorneys who come in and litigate cases. Um, you have uh, your run-of-the-mill cases, but you have everyday citizens who come in for their everyday, every life issues, whether it be with their landlords or landlords with their tenants or neighbors, or unfortunately a lot of times families in family disputes um, over money or contracts. Um, you have small claims court where you know you can have anything from a medical malpractice case to someone didn't get their pizza delivered when they were supposed to. Um, so, and many of the people that come into civil court represent themselves because litigation is expensive and coming to court and either prosecuting your own case or defending your own case, it takes time. Justice is slow. It does take time. And it costs money. So a lot of people are representing themselves, which... When, when that happens, somebody represents themselves because you don't have enough money. But that just seems like it, it would just uh, weigh against you because you don't know how to defend yourself well. How, do you, how would you, as a civil court judge, be able to mit litigate and, and watch over something between someone who doesn't have enough money to defend themselves, someone who's got more money and more power to defend themselves, and try to make it fair and balanced? I would continue to do what I've done, because I've done it. Um, and I, that's part of the reason I believe I'm qualified for this position, because I have the experience. When someone comes in to represent themselves in court, under the law they are held to the same standard, the same laws, the same procedures, the same rules of evidence that an attorney is held to. And they are expected to know it as well. As a court attorney, which is what I am now, or a law secretary, um, and as a judge, you're not allowed to be an advocate for a party, so you can't give legal advice to the person representing themselves. You can't tell them how to do their case. But what you can do, and what I do as a court attorney when I'm conferencing the cases with people who are representing themselves against attorneys, um, is you can make sure that even though you can't give them the advice 
and you can't change the rules or the laws for them, you can make sure that the game is played fairly. And that's, that's what we want to hear. Yeah, and that someone's not taken advantage of because of their lack of knowledge. Um, and unfortunately, you know, you see that sometimes where, you know, someone comes in, they've never been in a courtroom before, and now all of a sudden they're, uh, just as an example from civil court, they're representing themselves against a credit card company because they couldn't pay their bill. And they have an attorney who is rightfully so getting paid for doing their job. And that attorney's job is to represent the company seeking the money they claim they're owed. And the attorney has every right within the bounds of the law to attempt to get that money back. What the attorney wouldn't have the right to do is take advantage of the fact that the pro se party, the person representing themselves, doesn't know the rules, doesn't know the laws. And as a judge or a court attorney, which I am now, but as a judge, I would continue to do it. You can make sure that the rules are not don't work against somebody just because they don't know. You can make sure that the game is played fairly, just like an umpire is supposed to. You can make sure that you know people aren't led down the wrong path. I mean, some things I say to pro se litigants sometimes is, the attorney's a very nice person, they're doing their job, but they're not your friend. They're not there to help you, you're here to help yourself. So you can make sure that the game is played fairly, because attorneys have a job to do, and it's not an easy one. I did it for many years on my own. Um, and they have a job to do, and they deserve to do it, because everybody deserves the right representation, even when you're representing yourself. So just for the audience, pro se means you're representing yourself. It's, uh, it, you're not using some other attorney, just so that everyone understands that when you file something pro se, it means you're filing it as your own representative. That is correct. Yeah. The, the, um, if uh, uh, the, the court system's the way they have been, what you've seen with your experience over the years and the cases that have come and gone, some must have pulled at your heartstrings. And, uh, and have you ever seen anything that was, you would have considered really unfortunate the way it went and that you might have wanted to change? Um, you know, there's probably been, there, not probably, there's been many um, throughout the course, not just working in the court system. I began my career as a domestic violence prosecutor. And um, you've had domestic violence experience. Yes. Um, I prosecuted domestic violence crimes, and um, that alone sh not so much showed me the unfairness of um, the system, but the, the lack of knowledge of our society as a whole on the toll that being a, a victim of domestic violence takes, the fear. Um, and I saw cases where victims were so frightened and so scared that they wouldn't testify against their abuser. Oh God, that, see that's and the thing I would, that would hurt me. I wouldn't be able to deal with that. <laughs> it, it wasn't easy and we tried to, in the proper cases, prosecute the cases without the assistance of the victim because it is frightening. Um, but it was difficult. I also saw cases where the victims testified against their abuser and you know there was repercussions for that, but um, on their personal level. Um, so f those cases, yes, I've seen things where sometimes the law, you know, you saw someone walk out of a courtroom who in your heart and based upon the facts, you know, should have been convicted of something. Um, the hardest thing about, I think, being in the system in general, or being an attorney in general, is um, my favorite book is To Kill a Mockingbird. I read it every year for many, many years. I think it gives us a lot of life lessons. And someone gave me the book once and wrote a on the inside when I was becoming an attorney to always remember that you'll win some cases you should lose and that you'll lose some cases you should win. But to always try to keep your eye on doing the best that you could, getting the most fair and just result, whether you were a plaintiff's attorney or a prosecutor or a defense attorney or even in the court system as a court attorney or a judge. Sometimes the law that has to be applied it hurts one side. It's, it's not always 100% fair on both sides. But as a judge, I would do my absolute best to make sure that the law, the appropriate law would be applied, but be applied with fairness and compassion. And I think that's a very important thing. You, uh, you just took a word out of my mouth. I'm hearing from you and the time that we spoke before and now uh, there's a compassion in you for having, I guess, maybe because of what you've seen in the past and what comes from you naturally and instinctively. 
if uh, hopefully that's going to be one of your trademarks I hope as, so. as a judge but uh, but let's talk about that because we're looking forward to another conversation with you but we'll end this one with with, with just one thought if you were uh, going to be getting this position as a civil court judge in the county of Queens and you're going to be assuming the chair and taking it when you would retire what would you say would be what you wanted everyone to remember you by what do you think you are going to bring to that chair that would be uniquely yours. I know I'm putting you on the spot, no, but, that's okay. but, uh, but I <laughs> that's do, I love question. to do that. <laughs> it's one of my favorite things, question. put them on the spot. I would hope that when people would look back, they could say that if they came before me, whether they won or lost, whether the case went their way or didn't, that they would say that they felt that they were heard, that they were listened to, that they were considered that they were treated with respect, and that they knew, win or lose, the outcome that it may be was done with the, the best of intentions in doing the job within the bounds of the law as a judge is required to do. You, you sound like you follow in the footsteps of a very prestigious judge, Judge Viscowitz. Uh, He's got that reputation. You must know I work for him. No. <laughs> No. Yes, I, he is. Judge Viscovich, I actually work for him right now. We work in the matrimonial court doing contested divorce cases. Yeah. And he is very much like that. And yeah. Judge Healy, when I worked for her before, she was very much like that. And many of the people that I look up to, um, that I have looked up to throughout my life, um, judges, attorneys, and so forth, have been those types of people. And that's very important to me. My father always said, you know, remember where you come from, remember who you are, remember you're not better than the person standing next to you, and always listen. You may not agree, you, you know, you may have a difference of opinion, but the mark of an intelligent person, of a compassionate person, is the ability to listen and to hear both sides and make a fair decision. And um, I believe that is the most important quality of a judge, to hear both sides and make a fair decision based upon the law. Well, there's a trademark for you right there. I, uh, I, Joe Murray, who I've come to respect a lot, he's a Republican. Yes, he is. And, uh, but, uh, but he's, uh, he's, he's kind of told me all about Biscowitz and, and how he, and then that's where I heard about him. So Yeah, Joe, I, I know, I don't know him extremely well, but I do know him from seeing him in the court system and working. He's been on a couple of cases that Judge Viscovich has presided over that I've been involved in. And he is a Republican, and I'm running as a Democrat. And I actually take a lot of pride in the fact that I am a Democrat. I'm running as a Democrat. I was nominated by the Democratic organization, and I'm proud of that. However, you know, there are people running against a lot of the Democratic slate right now, that, and from last year and this year, that are running on the change the machine, vote against the machine. You know, politics as usual it has to go. And look, I'm not a politician. I have never run for a thing in my life, and I honestly don't plan on ever doing it again. Um, it's, running for an election has taught me a lot. Judicial primaries are very new to this county. People have a choice, and they should have a choice. There are two people running for the spot I'm seeking, myself and my opponent. And people should research the, myself and my opponent. It's, you know, it's a Google search. It's a, it's a Facebook search. It's, it's easy today. Um, look at who we are. It's not just who's supporting you, although that is very important. You should look at the people who are supporting a candidate. I'm proud to. I'm proud of the people. I have the backing in this. In just in this area alone, I know I have the endorsement of um, Ed Bronstein, Assemblymember Bronstein, District Leader Carol Gresser, Senator Stavitsky. Um, I have the backing of Senator Leroy Comrie, uh, Congressman Gregory Meeks, um, and I'm proud of the backing I have. Does that mean when I take the bench that I'm in, you know, um, sitting in a position where I'm going to do favors for political cronies? Absolutely not. If I'm elected, I'm beholden to no one but the people that elect me to that position. Um, and I'm lucky that people like Joe Murray on the other side can see or hopefully, you know, agree with that I'm going to be fair and impartial whether you come before me as a Democrat, a Republican, an Independent, or whatever it may be. It's not going to matter. I don't ask you when you walk through the door. I'll never ask someone what's your political affiliation in this case or what's your religious views or you know are you what are your your feelings on social issues anybody who comes into a courtroom before me has a clean slate and will be heard based upon their their issues their facts as they are presented 
sure sounds like a candidate with fairness and compassion behind her. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to ask you a question. It's a little off to the side, sure. and then we'll end this for now, and we'll get back to to Jessica again. But um, what do you feel about this controversy? About uh, we understand with with COVID nineteen and social distancing and the elections, the the uh, the, the uh, changing for the balloting and mailing in your. Uh, that whole process. It's kind of gotten controversial. A lot of people are so against it with um, uh, on, on our social media. We've heard how against they are and how worried they are that it's not going to be fair. What are your feelings about the mail-in ballots? I, look, I think it's a good thing in that I can understand people's concerns. Obviously, you're, you're voting from home and you're filling something out and you're afraid that you're going to put it in the mailbox. It's not going to get there or something. But there are, it's, it's very strictly done. When you get the ballot, um, there are two envelopes, you have to fill it out, you have to put it in one envelope, you have to make sure that envelope sealed, you have to sign it and date it. You can't put a smiley face on it, you, you can't put a comment on it. I, I mean, I told my mother, uh, you know, if you vote for me, don't put a thing, that's my daughter. You, then your vote's no good, just, just, <laughs> just fill out the thing and, and that's it and send it in and, you know, then you put it in another envelope and you seal it and you mail it. Unfortunately, I've heard I, I don't know how accurate this is, but I have heard from several people that they've been had people knock on their door and say, we're from the Board of Elections. Um, we'll come back and collect your ballot and we'll make sure it gets to the polls for you. I can say this. The Board of Elections is not doing that. That's a scam, huh? Do not do it. Do not hand your ballot to anyone that you don't know. Um, if you don't trust putting it in your mailbox outside your house, walk to one of the mailboxes that have the tamper free um, openings slide it in, make sure it goes in. It has to be postmarked by the 23rd. You can walk it into your polling place on the 23rd if you're more comfortable with that and make sure they stamp it. I understand people's concerns, but I think with the state of the world as it is and, and the virus and how it has affected people, I think this was the solution because this now more than ever, I think voting is important. Um, I think people need to have their voices heard. And I think with this virus, if we didn't have the mail-in voting, I mean, we're on the, 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 the down end of the curve now, but we don't know what tomorrow will bring. And I think it was the solution to make sure that people who can't get out, who are uh, immuno, immunocompromised or ill or elderly, who otherwise would come out and vote, who can't, this gives them the opportunity. Why should their voices not be heard? So I think for now, this is the right thing to be doing. I think it'll give people the chance to vote. And um, I understand people's concerns, but if done correctly, I believe it'll work out fine. Jessica Earl Gargan, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you for your time. Much. Thanks for letting me put you on the spot there a little <laughs> bit. Okay. But, uh, okay. but, uh, and, and these are the candidates that you need to be listening to and considering and voting for when you go to the ballot or whether you mail it in. And thanks again for speaking to our audience because everybody's looking to find out who they want to vote for. Thank so you thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.